panel first, and if you would all stand up so they could see your smiley face. Uh, Knut Rimsrud. Knut is an Intel fellow and uh, one of our storage experts, and uh, he's also an expert on DeLoreans. So if you have any DeLorean, any DeLorean questions, questions, there's your man. Uh, and you can probably find you the part, too. I, I always know it's Knut because he's the only DeLorean in Oregon. Did you know him? Dr. Jim Held. Jim is uh, in the Intel Labs, an Intel Fellow, and focusing on uh, architectural futures and uh, our next generation architecture technology. Dr. Kevin Kahn. Kevin is a 30-year veteran of Intel? 33-year veteran of Intel. Um, uh, when I first became a Fellow, Kevin... <laughs> Kevin is, uh, uh, the way I put it, and I hope nobody gets offended, he's really the entire package. Oh, Kevin on, on. CPU architecture all the way up to network and even operating systems and applications. So um, just about every question I think today is going to go his way. Ajay Bhatt, you might recognize him as our rock star. Uh, <laughs> Ajay is an Intel fellow, chief IO architect. Um, even though that uh, he was given the, uh, uh, he was the rock star as a co-inventor of USB, his uh, true claim to fame, in my opinion, is he is the father of PCI Express. So, IJ. Dr. Vivek Day, uh, he and I one day are going to make idiomatic CMOS work. Isn't that <laughs> idea? Uh, comes from Georgia Tech. He works in our Intel Labs and Circuits and Research, and he's one of our top uh, circuits architects. Mark Bohr, Intel Senior Fellow, uh, our process guru. If there's ever a uh, a uh, quote in process technology, it's Mark, that's uh, uh, driving Intel's engine. Rich Ulig, uh, man of many talents, uh, Intel uh, comes from the Intel labs and he is the father of our virtualization technology. Shiv Kashik, he's the one who tells me I can't talk to Microsoft unless he's with me. So, I'm uh, <laughs> a software and solutions group and uh, one of our chief OS architects. And last but not least, Dr. Tiki Thacker. He was my, uh, he may not remember, he was the first professor I had in graduate school and then uh, joined Intel in 93. Yeah. He and I, a little story, I hate to, I shouldn't tell this, but I will. Um, <laughs> when we were debugging the P6, we'd go in the lab and uh, I've been doing this for years and Dickie would come in and he'd say, what are you triggering on? You gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. It drove me nuts. So I'd say, I got a meeting, I'll be back here at five o'clock. We'd walk out of the lab, as soon as I saw him turn the corner, I'd go back into the lab and start working. <laughs> I had to come clean after 15 years. <laughs> anyway, this is Fellows Live and Uncensored. Um, you have the esteemed body here. The ground rules are, uh, ask a question that hopefully we can answer. Um, and we'll try to be as truthful and honest as possible as only we know how to be. Uh, and if the question is good, we actually have, we used to do Home Depot cards. And they've upgraded it to iTunes cards, and I was kind of hoping we would only get like 10 or 15 people here, and then we could take half of these home, but I think we're going to go now. So if we do, we also have um, USB keys, isn't that right, Jack? Okay. So, let's get started with questions. Uh, the two ladies here will move the microphone over. I think we're, are we on the web, too? Oh, we're not? Okay. It's a question here. Kevin? Hey, Steve. How are you? Good, Dave. Uh, this is actually from Mark uh, on the uh, process side. So, where do you see the optical lithography and silicon? How far out do we have on it before something more radical than we needed? Okay, uh, I think as we've already uh, discussed, uh, uh, Intel's 32 nanometer technology is Intel's first generation to use 193 immersion lithography. Uh, we're extending immersion to the 22 nanometer generation, so it'll still scale to that generation. And uh, also to the 15 nanometer generation. Right now, that's what I'm spending my time on, 15 nanometers. So 193 will extend to the 15 nanometer generation. Uh, beyond that, uh, the 11 nanometer generation, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm expecting that the EUV lithography, which is uh, uh, 13 and a half nanometers, will be ready and, and will serve uh, the needs of that generation. By the way, that uh, Logitech Universal Remote you told me to get, yeah. best thing I've ever purchased. I want to thank you for that. You still have yours too? Yeah. yeah. More questions? <laughs> you didn't get a card. Oh, I'm sorry. There, there's one in the back. Oh, I see you. Sorry. Hi. Um, I heard that Intel is getting into a smart grid, and how will that change our life? Um, 
that question. I'll go ahead and take that one since it's uh, my group that's actually working on it. Uh, there are multiple, so how is it going to change your life? The belief is, is that, uh, um, and uh, a friend of mine from HP who actually is in the, in the, in the group today, um, has actually um, been able to put an instrumentation on his uh, HVAC system to look at how, they, how much he can save in terms of overall energy in this. And a significant, and maybe I'm misquoting him, but somewhere around 10 to 15 percent energy savings just in terms of being able to control his device in a much more intelligent manner rather than setting a thermostat and hoping that it works out. So when you look at overall energy usage, one of the big problems that is facing um, uh, the U.S. energy grid is not only security, but it's also the ability to deliver true and reliable power. And so what they want to do is they want to be able to instrument all the way down to the dev devices inside the home and be able to have different collection points to move up. How's that going to change your life? Number one, energy usage should be lower on the order of 10 to 15 percent. There's also the benefit in terms of carbon improvement. You, you know, you, maybe there's carbon credits that can be generated. The bigger issue is um, uh, for those of us who lived in Oregon last year, we had a problem or actually the Bonneville Power, who runs the Northwest Power Grid, had a problem because there's a tremendous number of wind farms and they actually had an overload of the grid. And their biggest worry is, is now when people put in, say, solar panels and they can actually sell distributed energy back into the grid, how are they going to control that? How are they going to monitor that and be able to keep the grid up and, and reliable? And they're also worried about cyber attacks. So smart grid actually encompasses a lot of different things. Why we're interested is it has compute all the way up and down the stack to the simplest controllers all the way up to the large high performance computing systems that will sit in the national labs that will actually model and simulate the grid at any point in time. And, you know, that's the kind of technology we can bring to bear. Oh, no, there was this question first. Now we'll get to it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm giving away cards. I'm actually pretty bad at this. <coughs> i got to go get cards. <coughs> We're all hearing about SSDs now, and Intel is, is in that field. But the controller is inside the SSDs. Could, could someone please unlock the mystery? I, I think that's probably a uh, question for me uh, on the SSD front. Uh, I'm not sure there really is a mystery about the uh, controller that's uh, in our, our SSD. Um, the controller that's in the, the SSD that we're currently shipping is a 10-channel uh, parallel controller. Um, that has a, a SATA connection on one side of it, has 10 NAND channels on the, on the back side, and then inside of the controller uh, we do uh, um, parallelize the axes in order to uh, best distribute the workload across the NAND channels. Uh, and then of course there's all the secret sauce for uh, doing efficient wear leveling to, uh, to extend the endurance of the drives and all that stuff. But that's all just firmware running on a microcontroller in our, uh, in our controller in the SSDs. I'm not sure if you had a particular question about the nature of our controller. Well, I imagine the, the knowledge base that comes from years and years of semiconductor manufacturing, and I'm curious as to what generation the controller's at, and the roadmap for future controllers. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the lithography that we use for our, uh, our controller is really not a uh, leading-edge lithography like our, our, our high-performance CPUs, and there really isn't a necessity for it. Uh, the controllers that go into our, our SSDs are much more modest kinds of circuits than, uh, than our leading-edge processors. So it is not a leading-edge process, um, but our controllers are more of a system on a chip, if you want to think of it that way anyway, with, uh, with both uh, internal SRAMs and, and microcontrollers and our NAND channels and so on. So it's not a leading lithography controller that we have in our, our, uh, our SSDs, and there, there really isn't a, a compelling reason for that to, to be the case anyway. Um, you know, about 10 years ago, I did an HP Jornada 820, could this instant, literally instant on-off and easy battery life for a day. And here we are like 10 years later, admittedly computers are more complicated life, but we can't do that. What's it going to, what has to happen in order to have a true instant on, instant off on uh, notebooks today? Um, good question, actually. Uh, this whole target of, uh, see what has happened is, you, you heard about it 10 years ago, but then again, the workloads that we have today were not there 10 years ago. Uh, today's workloads are much more demanding. Uh, from our side, if you, if you want to go recount the progress that we made from the process to
technology point of view, Mark has given us fantastic low leakage process, right? So we have a reasonable improvement there. In the designs, you know, Dari talked about power gating and voltage scaling and clock gating. So we've done that. I think as we go forward now, the key challenge is the architecture level. You know, having operating systems, they're much more responsible, having applications, uh, they're also much more power aware to uh, device drivers and even devices. They're much more responsible about their activity factor and the idleness and getting some uh, predictability. Um, and unless we solve this problem holistically, Right? It is going to be very difficult because when it comes to power, one misbehaved device could defeat all your power policies. One of the offending devices in the platform up till now has been USB, and I'm responsible for it, right? And now, um, to some part. So we're learning a lot, we're also collaborating a lot. So, so that's the part of uh, power. But now to that, the new wrinkle here is always on, always connected. Your wireless standards, right? And uh, that is also another tough problem to solve. So from the mainstream notebooks, right, we continue to learn and improve. Um, and I think the next area of improvement is, I'm looking to Tiki actually. I'm, I, I, I go talk to his guys to learn, you know, what they do. But Tiki, if you can elaborate. Yeah, so I think the, as Ajay pointed out, that um, in the uh, notebook space and the PC space, you are kind of tied to the environment you're running, you know, the operating systems that are there today and all of those things. So um, you really need to figure out, as, a, as I said, it's, a, it's not just the silicon side of problem, you have to solve both on the software side as well. So in the mobile internet devices where we have had you know, more freedom to change some of the supports that we need you know, with the mobile and operating system that we are driving uh, for the handheld devices, we are able to do, I mean, we can do instant on, instant off, we'll go in and out of power saving states in a matter of milliseconds, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, today on a notebook text what takes seconds, you know, we do it in seconds, you know. So, it is possible to do it, we've done it, it's just the different environments that we are in, and it's going to take some time to change the legacy. Uh, don't sell the present platform entirely short, though. I was just thanking Canute as we sat over there, because I have a solid-state drive in my laptop, and I don't turn it off. I don't worry about instant on, instant off, I leave it on. I shut the lid so the display goes off, which is a major source of power constraint. Mm -hmm. And I can walk around all day with it under my arm, not worry about shock, not worry about turning it on. And while other people fish for their Blackberry to check an appointment, I open it up and look at it. And I go hours and hours and hours. I can go through the day with a good today's laptop. I think it'll get better with the Nahila Mobile with its power gating. With today's solution, we've come a long way. And I think some of it is also thinking about things in a different way, which is always on. So the real math is, you know, the battery today is what, 65 watt hour batteries, 55 to 65 watt hour battery. If you want your laptop to last all day long, right, and I'm saying eight hours, take eight hours, you know, so you need about eight watts, right, eight watts of average power throughout the day. If you consume that much, you get all day battery. Of course, your mileage will vary. No, I didn't this. I think we beat this horse to death, actually. I think see if we can get another question. That's why I know. <laughs> um, so, in terms of CPU, memory, and I have a performance. Ah, you need a card. Hey, excuse me. Were you going to hand out those cards, or do we keep them in the We'll swap, everybody. We'll swap. <laughs> so, in terms of CPU, memory, and I performance, we know that I was the bottleneck. Even with the SSDs, we're still magnitudes of, you know, away performance from really saturating and, and unlocking the true power of the CPU. Where do you see the Nirvana in IO performance? Uh -huh. Oh boy. Uh, 
They told me these weren't going to be easy questions when they talked me into this. Um, there's a, a lot of discussion going on, uh, certainly in how we use SSDs to improve the overall I.O. performance of our systems. But really, SSDs are still storage. And uh, even with SSDs, there's still a couple of orders of magnitude uh, a gap in the storage hierarchy between the slowest DRAM layer in the hierarchy and the fastest SSD layer in the hierarchy. So there, there is a gap in there. Uh, and I think that um, there's probably going to be some focus to try to find elements that might fit into that gap in order to better fill in the entire hierarchy because of the, um, the discontinuity in the steps in that hierarchy. Uh, I'm mostly a storage guy, and so I don't really know too much about the memory hierarchy stuff. But I can tell you that for the SSD part, we're going to push the SSDs up from the bottom as, as far as we can go. And you might have seen the million IOP demonstrator that we did in Bob Baker's keynote uh, yesterday as well. That's just kind of a proof of concept of, yeah, we can push quite a ways up, even with fairly modest systems, and even with a fairly modest number of SSD types of devices. And so certainly we'll push that up, but there's still a gap there in the middle, and I'm not the right guy to talk about that. Maybe you know more about the memory Aspect. Well, simplistically, we're going to bring stuff closer to the core. So over time, you'll start to see more and more of the technology being integrated or getting closer and closer to the CPU so we can take advantage of the larger number of um, IO pads that are available on the die itself and not have to go through the package. Now, that's going to take time because, um, you know, you either bid on a particular technology or you can use your MIPS to be able to give yourself a broader um, capability to be able to support with the protocols. But over time, that's what the direction is going to be. PCI Express over its life has been uh, a spectacular run. Uh, did you guys ever expect it to have such a run and what, if any, challenges do you visualize in its continued run, in its continued run? I think um, in uh, 2001, or IDF, and, or 2002, I think, somewhere around there, when I talked about PCI Express, I said that it is a 10-year technology. At least we'll do three generations because you do, you know, in the I.O. world, the cadence is about three to four years, you know, depending on the complexity. So we knew that we could at least do the three generations. And at that point, I was sort of uh, predicting that beyond that, we'll have to rethink the approach. And uh, at that point, it looked like um, maybe we'll have to go optical at that point, right? Um, so I was asked this question, I think, by a couple of people here. I give my uh, at idea of uh, this week, and my guess is could probably take one more crank at it if we try hard enough, right? Of course, that will involve some compromises, some relaxing of parameters, um, but that's probably about it. Um, beyond that, you try to solve the problem. Gets where you need exotic materials, exotic, you know, much more complex signaling, and then you sort of start going away from your high volume manufacturing kind of parameters that you would need. Yeah, yeah. well, I was going to say it's worth pointing out though that I think you saw at least one indication that we're trying to continue the life even further, because I think Ajay does a, a service to the future there in some sense. In uh, Dottie's keynote this morning, one of the things that was running over that opt optical fiber demo was PCI Express, and it was running across the stage to a um, storage uh, controller that was on the other side of the stage. So I think, you know, as Ajay says, I think correctly, we're, we're going to try to crank, turn the crank again on, on what we've got, but ultimately as we run into uh, kind of uh, limits of uh, frequency times distance, essentially, you know, in the electrical domain without getting too exotic, the next obvious place is to, is to try to take it into the optical domain, and we are already beginning to show indications of how to do that. So, um, can pray just to expand no, on some of the comments. Yeah, so Ajay, uh, just expanding on Ajay and Kevin's comments, the, uh, they're talking maybe a little bit more about the electricals and so on, but I mean, as a standard, PCI Express has proven to be fairly uh, adaptable, and, and we still see improvements in it. You know, virtualization is a relatively new trend. And, um, a number of new standards have evolved around that to make natively shareable I/O devices. And so, you know, those are reasons to believe that it'll, it'll certainly stay around for a lot longer. Because oh, as, a, as an architecture, it's yeah. actually yeah. part of the platform. Uh, the, the key debate is physicals. How far can you push? Right? 
I don't think there's any argument about yeah. the, uh, the architecture. Architecture is here to stay. That's how all operating systems will interact with devices. Because in, in the platform, if you look at it, there are three sort of dominant uh, software stacks. One is um, PCI or PCI Express, USB, and TCP IP when it comes to dealing with somebody. Of course, there is storage and other things, but mm -hmm. minor details. <laughs> okay, so so we can get back on track. Are there any yes no questions? So we can <laughs> and um, you know we have uh, uh, an OS guy, and I'm sure there's a lot of software questions in there. Of course, they use uh, circuits. Yeah, I'll pick. I, I just turned 50 this year. My vision's going bad, so I do see their hands in the back. And we'll how about in the way back, and then we'll kind of move forward. Oh, that was okay. <laughs> Um, so I want to um, ask a question about um, Intel's known for the microprocessor, the uh, background microprocessor. But as we evolve more and more into uh, having more and more devices on the internet, and it's all about the internet, um, do you see a, uh, and we, we move in towards what uh, AJ was saying about uh, connecting everything wirelessly, it, Obviously, we cannot put a microprocessor behind every node in the house or a smart grid or, or connected bodies, but do you Why see not? that? Why not? Why not? My question. Why not? I think quite serious. Why not? Okay, so You're in America. Ask, do you see the rise of the microcontroller again? Yes. <laughs> um, yes. It has an IA instruction set. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure what a microcontroller is compared to a microprocessor. I mean, it's, it's, it's all in the eye of the beholder, right? And, uh, you know, there'll be computation in all those nodes. And, uh, you know, people have been doing kind of uh, micro TCP stacks for years in amazing little, little space. So, I mean, I think that structure is, is well, the yeah. future. And in the lab, we've actually gone back to the old 486 and looked at it at the latest process technology. That would be an excellent microcontroller with the appropriate peripheral devices that are around it and, and some non-volatile memory that's there. So I'm actually serious. Yeah, I see a microcontroller and I see it with an IA instruction set. Um, I think I'd get fired if I didn't say anything else. <laughs> actually, I'm going to continue to go forward, so, so bear with me. Uh, the young lady, yes, you. No. I said lady. <laughs> I said, lady, and this guy goes, yeah, I want to. <laughs> I'm sorry, oh, could you stand up so we can? <laughs> As we keep inventing new platforms and keep coming out with new solutions, we are generating more computers and thus, in the end, more e-waste. Um, what things are we doing to try and head towards a more green PC, more green computing model? I knew that was the reason Will Swope was here. Who is the other guy that weighs his hand over here? <laughs> Will, this is for you. What are you looking at me for? <laughs> well, well, yes. Actually, you can answer it or I can answer it and you can chime in if I get it wrong. Okay. Um, when you, um, so there is a growing community within the technology industry that is recognizing the issue of e-waste and when you see pictures from people who are living in the dumps in Asia and whatnot, you see that, it's a, that, that it is a real issue. But this is something that's growing organically, so instead of being forced, you know, the, the, what you'll see is the industry, not necessarily just our industry, but industries in general, are really starting to move forward proactively because they know if they don't, and they don't start taking this situation critically and doing something about it, they will be legislated to do something, and that is not necessarily the right thing to do. And you're gonna see it, and we're starting to see it more at an industry level where it's organically growing. The systems manufacturers are the ones that, you know, have the, the, that are recognized as having the largest problem, and they're starting to put together the types of consortiums and efforts in order to make this happen. It's a nascent um, effort. I think it's going to take some time to actually grow and, and, and get better, but I think you're going to see more and more companies starting to take, to take a leadership role because they recognize if they don't, it's going to happen to them, and then when that missile lands, you don't, you don't know where that missile is going to land and what it's going to do to your business. So, Steve, I think I, I think I can add to that that uh, Intel's process technology, at least our microprocessor products, uh, kind of led the industry in providing lead-free package technology. That was at our 45 nanometer generation, 
And then late in the 45 and new generation, we provided halogen-free packages. So I think we've been a leader uh, in our industry in, in converting our technology to you know, safer materials. Um, oh, by the way, if you work at Intel, please lower your hand. You can always send us an email. <laughs> um, you're going to ask a process question. I'll wait on you. She's going to ask you about transistors, Mark, and I'm really glad that you're here. So, okay. I'm going to ask one that's impossible. All right. Uh, next question. <laughs> I'll make an assertion. Uh, it's my judgment that most of you have been here 10 years, and I'll make my assertion that the computer we're talking about is a thousand times more powerful than it was 10 years ago. And so since you're supposed to be visionaries, and since our group is thinking about what's happening next week or next month, I'd like you to tell me what would it look like 10 years ago with a thousand times more horsepower across the board. It's Jim, right? Jim. Um, You're right. I'm not really sure I understand your question, but remember when we met at IDF a couple yeah. of years ago, it was the same, same thing. Question. I didn't understand the question, so at least that hasn't changed in five years. <laughs> <laughs> so, if, so the question is, is if we had uh, if the computer of the last 10 years ago... No, was, the computer of 10 years ago, look at the number of... Uh, the size of the microprocessor, the number of bits, the size of the, you know, how much is on it, how fast it works, all of those things is about a thousand-fold enha enhancement, memory, etc. You can't, no one, no one can see that far. No one could see 10 years ago where we would be today. If you'd said that we'd be here 30 years from now, it would have been satisfactory. What are we looking at? In other words, we're, it's, a re it, it's not over. It's a revolutionary thing. We heard already uh, we're looking at 12 nanometers or something. That's almost halfway there. Larger, larger uh, wafers. We can see it on that presentation. You guys mind if I take this? I mean, I'm feeling kind of I'm saying fire away. Go ahead. Really? Do you want to take this? Sky's the limit, <laughs> really. So, um, so, Jim, so I'll give you an example. And it may not be, you know, uh, uh, a holistic view of the entire industry, but uh, DARPA just published a report on what they call their exascale computer, you know, the exascale technology. And they say, okay, why does anybody care about something that can exec execute 10 to the 18 flops? Well, there's still some significant grand challenge problems out there like computational chemistry, um, uh, aerodynamic design, you know, all kinds of different things that are difficult to solve with the machine of today. And oh, by the way, the intelligence community has a significant problem in that the severity and the intensity of attacks are greater and greater, and they need to be able to identify attacks and respond as quickly as possible. I mean, there's just a whole myriad of needs in terms of, boy, if we had greater, greater machines today, that would be wonderful. If we take today's technology and scale that out in 10 years, those will be, one machine will be a 400 megawatt machine. So now DARPA said, you're going to have to get a 1,000x improvement in performance Got with a 10% or greater, or 10x greater, or 10x, or roughly what you're going to get today with today's machines. Those are going to require new technologies, new architectures, new software, new everything else. Now from that, and if you can get ahead of that train, I think it's going to spawn new industries that we can't even imagine today. But having that challenge and knowing that we've got to get a thousand-fold increase in performance at, at roughly equal power to where we are today is a That's huge right. issue. Now, we believe we have ways to solve it. DARPA listed in their 235 page report. By the way, if you ever get tired, you need to fall asleep and you're, you're insomnia, turn out that report. I guarantee you, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a long one. But with that, that's going to spawn the, the new technologies and potentially new right. industries that can come out. You know, it's, it's, I think it's also worth observing that that's, that particular vector is only one vector of interest, right? I mean, because it's not just that we have a thousand times better processors today at the high end, right? We have basically similar processing power in an incredibly small footprint in right. handheld devices. I think the next big horizon is actually a huge explosion in embedded. Uh, because today, especially when you look at sustainability issues and, and, and efficiency issues, huge parts of our, our economy are incredibly wasteful 
simply because they don't take advantage of the ability to compute and communicate what they're doing. Uh, you know, the transportation industry, there's a section right after this that some guys are doing, that guys are, uh, I'll be in for the beginning of at least. You know, the transportation industry is incredibly inefficient in its actual footprint in ways that would be directly solvable by better computation and communication capability done in the right way. So it's not just can we take the top end up, but it's can we take that same technology base in other in other vectors where other pieces of that tech, uh, uh, other figures of merit are more important and allow us to penetrate, you know, a lot of other areas of computation where the benefits, you know, can be very significant, you know, in fundamental ways for the, for the society. Uh, one, Stephen, if I may. Oh, you may. One more. Massive data has been mentioned, too, that we won't just have amazingly increased ability to compute. We're accumulating massive amounts of data that will lead to new approaches. If you apply massive compute to massive data, you get unexpected approaches to things like machine <coughs> translation, which we've been yeah. trying to do with very sophisticated algorithms and group for statistical methods actually do very well now. So I think that the massive amounts of data we're now accumulating are going to be another part combined with compute that will lead to unexpected new well, opportunities. I agree. That's a great question, Jim. Uh, we're going to have a transistor question. So would you like that, Mark? Uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, you're letting me down. This is after three years of this. <laughs> and get the same answer, right? I don't know. Uh, Ask Mark Gore. I have a philosophical question. Um, we, the, the, growth, the, the surge in growth on the internet is uh, resulting in a situation where communications and communications capability uh, is becoming as important or more important than the processor. Um, just the amount of data that is being generated that has to be stored and managed. Um, just wanted to know how we thought about that and over the years you've incorporated different uh, uh, technologies into uh, the basic processor. Just wanted to know what you guys are thinking about on the communications front. Is there some kind of a mini cross-connect switch that's going to show up? in the processor package sometime within the next 10 years? Well, I mean, I, I don't think that the, the communications problem is, is fundamentally today the one that's actually limited so much by what our silicon does. We can, we can build incredibly sophisticated silicon. Uh, in the communication space, it's actually, well, the most popular part of the communications space, which is wireless, it's probably more limited by things like regulatory and spectrum issues than almost anything else. There's uh, a lot of energy going in across the globe to better allocations of spectrum, better ways to utilize spectrum, and we've been very active in that. You don't necessarily think of that in terms of, gee, we're a microprocessor or a, you know, a computer company, how does that you know, play out? But, but basically, you know, we do see that the ability to have very high-speed ubiquitous communications is key to a whole bunch of the kinds of applications, actually, we were just talking about a moment ago, I and mean, some of these, these sort of new opportunities we'll have. So I would say probably the number one area for communication improvement isn't so much the direct technology. Uh, we're getting very, very good. If you look at things like uh, next generation WiMAX or next generation LTE, uh, you know, these are communication schemes that are extremely efficient with their use of spectrum, uh, which is not to say that, you know, there aren't more improvements left, but we're, we're getting pretty far out on the curve of efficiency. Uh, it now becomes more of a policy question there as to the kind of communications. Um, you know, another area is sort of one we touched on earlier, which is what is the practical economic limit of copper? You know, we're not there today, but it's certainly within, you know, within shouting distance somewhere out there over the next decade where we'll say, you know, to push copper faster and farther kind of limited, so we're going to have to, you know, get to optical. And there, it's again, it's a question of can you make the, the cost trade-off work for that kind of technology in the kind of platforms that, you know, mere mortals buy. Now, you know, if you go back a few years, people would have said the radio wasn't going to get cheap enough. And, you know, nowadays, radios are a dime a dozen. So, I mean, I have absolute faith we're going to get there on the optical front as well. But I think that's really where the interesting action is. Uh, and from that, you'll see new ways to, 
connect that into the processor. I mean, Steve talked earlier about, you know, with these very large data sets and moving lots and lots of information that we're going to have to do a better job of integration of, of some of these capabilities and processes. Things like that will happen. But I think you mentioned. You patiently raise your hand. No, the gentleman in the glasses. Yes. You guys have talked uh, fairly well about the expansion of computing power down to the low end and way, way up to the high end. Um, on the high end, my question is on the high end. You have, uh, what is it, 64 threads, 32 cores today, growing over time to probably hundreds if not thousands of threads and cores. If you discount virtualization, what are the workloads that live on those platforms? And are they and not, not so much on the high-end computing, you know, the energy management for the grid or, or uh, intelligence applications, but workloads that live not only in enterprises, but in maybe the homes of tomorrow. Um, well, gee, now that you took away the part I was going to talk about. <laughs> one, one question is, why do you discount virtualization? Yeah. But yeah. taking that for a moment, I'm sure you respond to that. Uh, there are many workloads now that are in the enterprise uh, that are done with what we call scale out. And we have individual machines that that compute model could be brought on die with large number of cores with extremely fast high performance networks on die. And we're exploring what the implications of doing that would be for the, the uh, platform as well as the programming models to have all of those workloads that we know how to scale now but we don't think of as multi-core, we don't think of them as being on die. So that's one approach I think would be very promising and can be carried to a lot of workloads that are thread parallel, uh, in a, not just the data parallel on die uh, that we have today in visual computing. Right, I mean, I think increasingly we can expect virtualization just to be uh, ubiquitous embedded in every platform. And so uh, the techniques, just like Jim was talking about, you know, can be readily applied. Um, classic met met models for, for doing uh, uh, distributed computing and parallelizing that way can be scaled down without having to build necessarily um, a coherency domain that you're able to, you know, maintain coherency. So, so um, I think we should count on virtualization until we can apply to, to the problems of scale. Yeah, I completely agree. And even though you told me I couldn't focus on the high end, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, the machines that we were talking about with Jim's question, they're going to be on the scale of hundreds of thousands of cores and billions of threads. And the reliability of machines of that, of that large a magnitude are pretty, you know, pretty hard to maintain. So even those machines will start to focus on more of a virtualized infrastructure because you can't possibly reconfigure the machine because you took something out and redo your MPI ranks. It's just impossible in the, in that, at that kind of scale. So I agree with Jim and Rich. You're going to see more and more of a virtualized infrastructure, not only you know not only at that level, but even moving into larger larger levels of abstraction. And you know, don't discount the the role that the the heavy amount of parallelism that visualization plays, and the more that visualization comes into our everyday lives in terms of being able to interact with the machine. And those algorithms, correct me if I'm wrong, are extremely parallel. Yes, they're very naturally parallel. The more the immersive computing experiences take hold, the more we begin to extend our move from it that started back with text through 3D graphics into 3D into uh, more interaction through sensors with the computer that builds a model of us and we interact with a simulation model. All of that is highly parallelizable and very compute intensive. Next question. I was starting to wonder if maybe your right eye was a glass yeah, eye. We you could only see the worried that you weren't paying attention to the side of the <laughs> this, this is actually a real I told you I just turned 50. Give me a break. <laughs> By the way, the vision, the vision yeah, is the Some of us think that's actually a good number. number. <laughs> Been there, done that. This is actually a pretty straightforward question. I can't uh, see you. My right eye is a glass <laughs> eye. <laughs> Not philosophical at all. Uh, today when Lightpeak was announced, they talked about 10 gigabits per second, and then the release that came out uh, from the marketing department said uh, 100 gigabits per second in the next decade. And I'm wondering, what are the limit what are the challenges between 10 and 100? Are they material? Are they protocol? Uh, is it, uh, you know, all, yes, all of the above. 
And also, uh, can I assume that uh, Light Peak is coming out of your silicon photonics uh, initiatives? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I guess I get that. Um, well, I guess you can take it. I mean. <laughs> well, you can take it if you want. Uh, so, uh, the initial implementation that we're playing with right now for Light Peak is not based on silicon photonics, it's based on a pixel technology. Um, when we look at sort of where we go next with it, we think the silicon photonics type technology is probably the way we get to the higher data rates. Um, so we're, you know, I mean, you say what are the, the, the barriers? Um, you know, one is just deciding, you know, what, whether you want to move data in a single stream or in a, a, a set of separate colors, uh, for those of you, you know, wavelength division uh, type of solution. Um, that actually looks better for a lot of reasons. I mean, one being that the, the local limit on the way in which you interface to the drivers of these kinds of things can stay a little more parallel that way. So there it's a matter of engineering and just kind of when does the cost point for that stuff uh, get to where you want it to be. Uh, we're trying to understand with some of the OEMs uh, and, and potential users of the technology, what are the, what are the target sweet spots, if you will, for performance. So we know we can do 10 now. Uh, we think, you know, relatively, you know, if we're talking about this as a decade te te type technology, uh, you know, relatively near future, we'd like to get that up into the somewhere between, you know, 25 and 40 range. Uh, that turns out when you look at, do an analysis of a bunch of applications to be an interesting spot. Uh, and then if you're talking about applying the technology, you know, sort of to very high-end systems, then, then, you know, 100 and up actually is, is interesting. And we've been, you know, we've been kind of looking at that in labs and, and have, uh, you know, some prototypes just about done of some, you know, 100 class systems using silicon photonics. They're not cost effective today, but, you know, will they be cost effective in, you know, a few years? Probably yes, in, in some form. So, I mean, I think that the, the, the real trick here is going to be engineering this stuff so it stays in a cost envelope that is uh, usable by people. Because, you know, people today do, you know, a gigabit optical, it's just incredibly expensive. It's not something you're going to put on your, your client system. You know, from our perspective, this stuff has to cost, you know, a couple of bucks, literally. And uh, we think that's very achievable. But once you set that envelope, that also gives you kind of a time frame over which you're going to be able to boost the speed and stay in that envelope. And, but it's not only cost, it's power. I mean, we're having to measure on a per bit, per watt basis, or milliwatt, microwatt basis, end to end. end yeah, speed. although the, uh, the joules per bit numbers for optical actually look pretty good. I'm not saying they don't look yeah. bad. they got to get a lot better. Uh, you know, so, I'm not saying... They're probably, better than electric. Hey, so okay, anyway, so before we get... <laughs> before we go... Because I'm moving that mistake. So you see what kind of stuff I have to put up with on a daily basis. Um, we got seven minutes left. We've got two guys that haven't had a chance to talk yet, Vivek or Shiv. Now, you, you got to have a software or circuit question. These guys flew down here. They put on a shirt. They're wearing an apron. They're embarrassed. <laughs> they leave and ask them a question. So if you've got a circuit or a software question, we will ask. And you're pointing to one over there. So this is both, so it's a bonus. <laughs> uh, although maybe they shouldn't have given me the mic um, in the first place. So circuits and software. Right now, um, you know, circuit functionality for combinatorial logic is really assumed for almost all chips. Uh, and at some point, that's not going to be the case because those transistors are going to get so small that, you know, randomness kills you. And I'm wondering at what point, you know, does it sort of become attractive to make the uh, unreliability of the underlying substrate somewhat visible to software? Uh, and, you know, I think earlier uh, there was a talk about machine check architectures and uh, other such things. David, we've got six minutes now. <laughs> I, I can, I can uh, start on that then shift can. So today a lot of uh, communication happens between the processor and the software for soft errors. And as we know for servers, reliable uh, uh, mainframes and uh, high-end servers. So the, the mechanisms for communicating, communicating bit failures for memories and uh, on-time memories and, and on-platform memories through the layers of software and hardware. Uh, some of that uh, will probably percolate into uh, lower levels in the die, uh, maybe you know, uh, some uh, register file failures or SRAM bit failures or maybe even logic failures. Uh, and uh, I mean, that, for that to work effectively, clearly there needs to be a 
detection mechanism on die to figure that out and then communicate that effectively to uh, whatever layers in the stack that they need to talk to. And I think software has a big role to play in making that work on, uh, on future chips. One of the key things that we have to worry about is that we can't have too many errors because the loop back through the software stack back in the die, you know, that, that can be uh, pretty long and that can really, really slow, slow you down in performance. Uh, loss can happen. At a macro level, you're already seeing a lot of that functionality today. So most of you would have seen, seen challenge demo yesterday where you actually had a machine checker, which was never injected into the machine. Um, Windows 7 2008 R2 picked up the error record from it and it went to the right? So you'll start seeing, actually, that's the first place where you'll start seeing the operating system being more actively involved in dealing with errors, actually even reflecting to the application to be able to go ahead and deal with that. So, I mean, that class of error was something that was an asynchronous error. Pretty soon you'll start seeing synchronous errors which actually occur when you're um, executing instruction stream getting reflected in the software and software being able to deal with that. So it's really, I think you'll see, a, going, I mean, we're seeing it today, going forward you'll see a lot of closer tie between the silicon, uh, the platform, the operating system and the applications and dealing with errors. And the further, the further you go up in the stack, the greater information you have to deal with the errors. Okay, I think we probably have time for two more questions, so right here. So um, Intel has always maintained that you need the Intel instruction set, even in handhelds, to have the full richness of the internet and online experience. Um, with the success of the iPhone and more particularly you know, of the App Store, and with software developers you know, tripping over each other to write new content for the iPhone, um, do you think that you need to rethink that strategy? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Kevin Kahn, would you like to answer the question? <laughs> it's a ticky question, for God's sakes. There's a class of applications that I mean, typically, when, when, let's say, my mother goes and buys a PC. Uh-oh. <laughs> she, she expects that all the applications that she has today, that she's been using for a pretty long period of time, your printers and so on, can be working. So there is still going to be a class of users that will use the applications that you're used to. I mean, it's essentially something like Word or Word processor and so on, right? And so there's clearly going to be a value in that direction. Um, at the same time, there's a, a significant um, level of familiarity with the AI instruction set. There's a lot of tools and a lot of uh, infrastructure available to go in and program for AI. Right? So a lot of that will naturally carry over to where um, the class of applications you're building will benefit from whether it's an app store or not, they'll continue benefiting from actually having the computer instruction set. Uh, I would just uh, echo what you said. And what the need is actually even more than you believe. For example, if you take something like Flash, you want to have it available on a mobile internet device. Today, you know, if you look at some of the smartphones, the Flash either doesn't work or you know it's not there or it's you know micro version of Flash. So having the compatibility, having it available same day it's available on PC is, for example, very useful and it uh, directly impacts the user experience. So compatibility helps a lot even in smartphone and mobile internet devices. One more question. See, I don't have a glass on I can see everybody. Sorry. Um, yes. Yes. Intel keeps increasing the number of cores in a package, so the software is not catching up in terms of parallel processing. So for the everyday usage like a laptop, what do you guys think uh, the number of cores maximum? I mean, uh, how many cores we should have in a normal nap, uh, laptop? Thousand. <laughs> <laughs> there, the software ecosystem moves relatively slowly compared to what we can do with new technology and the hardware. So you have to recognize that it will lag. But if the path towards increased performance is in parallelism, do we hold back on performance because not all of the apps can go there yet? Well, we're coping with that, I think, some really innovative ways like turbo mode. You saw how the resources of the processor and power were 
dedicated to a single core when that's what you had to run, or two if that's what you had to run. And I think that plus things like hyperthreading, which allows you to share the core for multiple threads, bridges the transition for software, uh, enabling us to really devote the, all of our resources most effectively to the characteristics of what you're running at the time, but still leave the opportunity for the new software, the, particularly the visual computing software, to have what it needs to deliver even better experience. So we have to transition carefully, and I think things like TurboMode are going to be very effective at that. Okay, unfortunately, thank you, Jim, and thank you for all your questions. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, after doing this for, what, three, four years, this has actually been probably one of the more interesting sessions we've had. So, again, thank you. I have an announcement. Um, one of our uh, ranks, Intel fellow number two, Gene Myron, uh, retired this year. However, he is holding a tech session in room uh, 3016 on the 21st Century Challenges, and I think that's at 415. And that talk's going to, and then afterwards, Jack Schmidt, Harrison Schmidt, who was the last man to walk on the moon. Uh, he was an Apollo 17 astronaut, and actually I think he was the only scientist. He's a geologist. Yeah, he's a geologist. Yeah, he will um, talk on his trip to the moon. Now, Gene will also tell you that he had an impact on the Apollo missions. He was instrumental in giving the go, no-go go for Apollo 12, so you might want to ask him about that. He loves telling that story. Anyway, thank you everybody for coming, and uh, hope to see you again next time.